Welcome to the Thousand Tales Podcast. I'm your host, Connor Logan, and welcome to a special edition of the Ventura County Poetry Project, trying something new here, which is bringing featured readers in from the poetry reading. So that I do at the Newberry Park Library Branch with my co-host, Ron Fullerton, um, and bringing them into my home recording studio for a sit-down and chat about life or whatever topic we want to, and intersperse in some poetry in there and just have a great time getting to know each other. Um, I'm very happy to have three wonderful poets for you today. Louise Cathcart, also known as Wheezy, uh, Joan Day, and Marcia Wingard, also Marcy. And so this last Sunday, October 23rd of 2022, they all came over and we sat down and chatted about life and poetry and read poetry and just really had a wonderful time getting to know each other. So enjoy this nice long interview with some great poetry interspersed. So Ron, hi. I want you to put into your calendar the third Sunday of the month. Okay. Oh and yeah. I want Connor, I want you to think about okay. it too. Third Sunday. We of need this your poems. Month. We're doing um, next month. Every the UU Fellowship on Old Caneo Road is doing um, an open mic. Yeah. The third Sunday of every month from six to eight. Huh. And okay. it, we're Musicians trying to get it, too. And oh, it's nice. fun. It's music. It's yeah. poetry. It's, it's stories. Any kind of talent, right? Yeah. Anything you can do. And loosely, a loosely uh, mm-hmm. like a variety <laughs> considered. <show. laughs> I'm sorry. Like a variety show. Yeah, right? but they call it an open mic. That's yeah. wonderful. And the guy that yeah. runs it is our, our music so director. So if you want to do something, we would love to have you come. Yeah, I, I went I one time. It was fun. Oh, that sounds and great. we want you to come yeah. again. Okay. Bring your wife. <laughs> Can I get anybody anything before we start? Name, th- there's a restroom right around the corner. I have. Um, I can go get some water. Or I would like a glass I would of water. Some water. I yeah. Hey, I, 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 yeah. I was going to bring. Sorry, some I didn't think that. about bringing my own. But no uh, problem at all. I hope you like my table I have for you. <laughs> <laughs> My so wife did this for me. She took, she took so a, a tom I wasn't using. She did an epoxy top on it. That's really nice. And I just said, go oh, ahead yeah, and have something that? fun. That's fantastic. Oh, well, it's an actual, oh, I see. Yeah, we actually, um, oh. yeah, this is a tabletop now. That's um, so cute. But can you drum on it? You can. You can drum on anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the head works a lot. Don't worry, I, I can easily prove that. And uh, all right, so let me go. Uh, three waters, Ron. You're good. No, I'm no. good. I'm okay. good. Thank you. It's good to see you. Good to see yes. you. Yes. Uh, it's sharp. This so we were just so talking about what what it was that Connor did for a living, and we didn't know, but now we know. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Right up your son's alley, really. I mean, does do, your daughter-in-law believe in that? I don't know. Oh, what oh, she I, don't, ble- I don't think she believes in any medicine. She's really... Oh. Mm-hmm. She's kind of a nihilist. <laughs> Just because she's Chinese doesn't mean she believes in Chinese medicine. <laughs> My wife had acupuncture done years ago, and she swears by oh, it. Oh, yeah. I believe I, in I, it. I, oh, I've absolutely. often wondered if that would help my knee. I have a bad... Oh, it would. It would help. The only thing that ever stopped me was money. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Actually, <laughs> no insurance, you know, for yeah. something like that. And most insurance does, doesn't pay uh, much. No. Yeah. no. I just bought a, a, I ordered a knee compression sleeve, which I think I'm going to wear pretty much all the time. I've heard those help. help. Listen, this, it, I don't want surgery. Yeah. Yeah. And I just, I'm, I'm, I'm finding that it's actually impairing my life. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to have surgery. I don't. We have a 91-year-old in our family, yeah. and her both of her knees are bone on bone now. Yeah. So it's very painful. They give her an injection every three months of a cortisone, but it's a special cortisone called Zilretta. It's long lasting, and it goes is it three months or four months. And it really, but that helps. really helps. I had it done once, and it helped. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And well, maybe I can have that done again. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice. Mine Thank well. you. It was a bo- it was twenty percent bone on bone. Yeah. Ten years ago, I yeah. said if I had bariatric surgery and lost weight, it would help. Ten years worth, and it did. Mm-hmm. And now it's ten years, and it's killing me. Yeah, I'm tired of it. Yeah, but it starts with a Z, Zilretta. You might ask about. It, it made a big difference for her. So I'm going to pick Connor's brain. Just one little piece sure. of free advice: scoliosis. 
with that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> can you use scoliosis? Um, can you use uh, Chinese medicine? For that's it? what I'm going to ask. Ah, that's the question. <laughs> yeah. But now, you know, I've lost some weight, so wearing this brace uh, really helps mm-hmm. a lot, where before it didn't. So mm-hmm. my swimming and all that is, mm-hmm. is helping. Great. Exercise is the best medicine. Yeah. yeah. Connor, uh, scoliosis for Chinese medicine? Absolutely. Chinese medicine for scoliosis. <laughs> yeah. I mean, no, you, you know, know yeah. Chinese medicine. Yeah, well, I worded that, that incorrectly. <laughs> <laughs> No, absolutely. It, um, actually, it's an interesting, interesting uh, topic because, like, you get lots of interesting questions <laughs> when, you, when you mention that you do acupuncture or Chinese medicine yeah. in general. And a lot of people will say, like, "Well, what's it good for?" And I'm like, okay. "Lots of things." It's a very nebulous question. And it's kind of the reason why my wife and I decided to do this style of medicine is because the variety of patients are so interesting. Like, my current roster of patients, I got you know people with what you would normally think, you know, neck pain or maybe the carpal tunnel, um, things like that. We have a lot of fertility patients, men and women. We work the couple as a pair to make everything as strong as possible and benefit the potentiality of a pregnancy, right? Yeah. And, uh, and but then like, uh, I also have like a child with night terrors, um, you know, uh, depression issues, anxiety disorders, digestive issues, gout, um, Diabetes, uh, neuropathy, um, bone on uh, bone knees. Bone. If there's not, if, if, well, I can't magically make cartilage appear. <laughs> but, but can you help? Yeah, can help reduce the pain and the inflammation in the area, and it, it, that's more of a palliative to keep it. But like usually at that point, either you know something has to be replaced, or they have newer therapies that a lot of them don't, aren't necessarily covered by insurance. You know, like like a stem cell injection or. Or disc replacement may be, but it depends on the... Somebody was telling me that there's some stuff that they put in face cream, and I can't tell you what it is, but it starts with H-A-U, hyaluronic acid. That. Yeah. Yeah. That they're now using that in minute quantities for knee injections, and using that in minute quantities for knee injections, and that's helping in a oh. different way hmm. than cortisone. So the best question I got going out, uh, was, you know, when someone said, what is something that acupuncture is good for that no one knows about? Mm. And I said, there is a great question. Mm. And it said, immediate post-stroke recovery. And it was like, number one, I didn't really? hesitate. Really? Interesting. Absolutely. That's what, I mean, I had a very awesome experience. It was probably 2012 or so, 13. And I'm in uh, residency in the, in the clinic. And, and, um, these two like nephews carry their uncle into the clinic. He had just had a, 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 a stroke like 90 minutes prior, and his uh, half his body was paralyzed. And he comes in, and I'm a I'm a level two uh, cl- clinician, which is like kind of middle, with working with a paired with a level three and Chinese guy. And I'm in in a, my my clinic director only spoke Chinese, so I had to be with a Chinese guy, so I had someone to translate and stuff like that, you know, and he liked my, he liked my acupuncture and like my style, stuff like that, and that, that, this older gentleman gets brought in with a stroke, talks to the clinic director, I guess they're friends, and he says, go in that room and go in with them, and I could hear them arguing, and, and like, I could see him like gesture towards me and stuff like that, and I could see the body language on my, on my, uh, level three partner's face. I'm like, what's going on? He's like, he says he doesn't want to be treated by a white guy. And I was like, <laughs> oh. And then it's like, he's, he's like, he's, he thinks you probably don't know your stuff and he wants to be treated by Chinese people. I'm like, oh. And he's like, he's like, no, but the clinic director is saying, basically telling them, shut up. These two guys are great. Let them do their work, mm-hmm. you know? And, and, uh, and so he comes in the room. We do treatment on him for like an hour and a half, strong treatment. And I'm working on the affected side he gets up off the table and walks out of the room. Wow. Oh and, and he comes out and he's just like, because like the whole time he's making all these like sounds like this is good, like he can feel, you know, he's talking to my partner in Chinese and, 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 he's, and he, um, I'm like, what's he saying? He's telling me all that, basically saying things like he can feel the flow, he can feel it connecting, he's like, your touch is, he says your st- touch and your strength are perfect, like he can, <coughs> you know, and then like he gets up and, and like kind of like shakes my hand and, and like he walks out of the room and, and he's like, he's like, I don't know if you know, but there were several moments in there that are like extremely rare for like Chinese 
older Chinese gentleman to give the kind of respect he was giving you. Wow. And like I'm like, I did not know any of those things. Mm. He's like, I figured you didn't. But he's like, there were several moments in there. And then like he comes out in the living room and he calls everybody to him, talks to them. It's kind of like the sign of respect in Chinese culture. If an elder like speaks or asks for asks for attention in a room, it's all given by anybody younger. And they all come to him and basically like points at me and I see everyone look at me and basically says like I was wrong. You should not have judged a book by its cover. And he's wow. like that guy knows good acupuncture and and you should, he's got a thing to show you or something like that. And then they all came over and they wanted me to show like what I did on the treatment. Wow. That was my technique that I used and different stuff like that. It was, that was the moment. Yeah. Like I always thought these things here were, were what I was really good at. And I toured a lot as a drummer in my 20s and stuff like that. But but um, that was like a moment. That was like a, that was a booyah moment of life. You know, right. that was really great. Sounds but, like it. I, um, but yeah, so that's why I always say post-stroke recovery, immediate, long-winded story, but we have no time limit here, do we? <laughs> that's right. Yeah. I'm really we'll glad to have... We'll be here at 4 o'clock in the morning. I right? <laughs> I'm glad to have all of you in. I don't know... I, I, all I have is Louise Joan and, and Marcy, or Wheezy Joan and Marcy, right? Yes. Wheezy. Okay. Uh, <laughs> where are you from? Oh gosh, so many places, but I was raised um, in the Midwest and uh, was in Chicago then for a long time in, in Nebraska. That was my childhood. Oh wow. And then I came out here in 69 to avoid uh, Mayor Daley, Vietnam demonstrations, uh, Martin Luther King's uh, death. <laughs> so um, yeah, came out to California, uh, just left everything, my, all my clothes and flew really? out to California in 1969. Was wow. it that that immediate of a need? That, that well, it was for me girl? because uh, I had ended up in the, I mean, really what happened was I sort of had a nervous breakdown with all the stress that was happening. And, and in, especially in 1968, that was the worst year in Vietnam. And Chicago was a hotbed. Uh, Martin, that's where Martin Luther King was. I, I remember I used to hear, um, gosh, look at that suit he's got on. He's not a regular nigger. You know, I mean, dealing with so much. So, and so I ended up by not being able to walk, and the doctors didn't know what was wrong with me. So I was in the hospital about three months, and uh, I thought, I have got <laughs> when my mother, uh, I told her I was going to leave for California. Well, hopefully, I, I mean, I was dating someone that... Um, that lived out here. So um, anyway, this is an awfully long story, but um, when I told my mother I was leaving and she says, well, you can't even walk. And I said, well, I'd rather die in California. Wow. So I flew out, lived with my boyfriend for just a little bit, and then the seas parted, got my first job in Beverly Hills, learned to drive. Everything was like ah, heaven. Oh, wow, you learned, you had to learn to drive? I, I learned to drive. Wow. I mean, Joan and I were talking about this the other day, how occasionally the universe, whatever it is, God, the force, the flow. Brings, the flow brings the seas part. The seas just parted, and everything was perfect. And so it took me about six months to get strong enough, but that was, that's how I got out here. <laughs> what a great story. What, um, what kind of car did you learn to drive on? A Datsun, $1,300 new. Really? It, cost, it cost three fifty to fill the thing up. Is it, oh, <laughs> yeah. is, it, is it a Datsun two ten or a five ten? It was the tiniest little Datsun. I bought thirteen hundred dollars. Yeah, two ten. Yeah. I remember the that. <laughs> it, is it, am I thinking of it right? It's like the little two door pickup. Yeah. It, no, it, it was, was a hatchback. It, it, it was it okay. was a hatchback. Oh, it was a two ten, yes. and it was also called the Bluebird. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, so, it was a wonderful little car, and I just thought. You know, how long has this been going on? And I'm a movie fanatic. Oh, you know? is she, yeah. uh, just a total fanatic uh, about um, um, acting and movie stars and all that stuff. What was your, what was your job that you got out here? Um, I uh, looked in the paper and there just happened. I went to an employment agency and she says, Oh, you know, would you like to work in Beverly Hills? I thought, Okay. Why not? And <laughs> <laughs> so I was um, an insurance adjuster making uh, like $300 more a month, which was a lot of money in those days. And I just, it was just, 
And then, and then I would go to these places in Beverly Hills, the key clubs, and meet movie stars. Mm -hmm. Steve McQueen asked me to dance. Wow. Yes, he did. <laughs> anyway, it was, you know, I mean, it was like hell, and then heaven. Heaven's over here. So anyway, that's all. Alan up. Watts. <laughs> The flow. The flow. The flow. I was in the flow, yeah. I think so. <laughs> what's a moment what's a moment you were in the flow, Marcy? Oh, I'm in the flow now. Yeah? Oh, I love that. That's a great <laughs> I, I, and it isn't just because I'm here. There's things going on in my life that are very Yeah, she is unusual, shall we say. Care to elaborate? That sounds great. Okay, I'm seventy seven, right? Okay. Uh five years ago I had a guy that I lived with, I sent him away. In August of, of 17, he died a year and a half later. I haven't had a guy around since. I'm in a, a creative writing class, and I fell in with a guy, and we were like crazy about each other. That's great. He's 75, I'm 77. That's great. Both widows, you know. And it's it's kind of like, you got to understand, I have a very full life. I mean, a really full life, and now I have this full life plus another half full life. <laughs> and he'd like all of it, and I'm just kind of like... <laughs> So he keeps talking about the flow and Alan Watts. So oh, I'm like, oh yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's a good way to describe it. The flow. Yeah, yeah. it is. Good for you. That's <laughs> My daughter asked this morning. She goes, "What's outside the universe?" Ah, uh -huh. and I was like. Answer that one, and uh, you'll have no problems. <laughs> yeah, right, that's, that's exactly. amazing. How old is your? I love that she's <laughs> nine. She, I love that that's she's a perfect searching, age. You know, I love for it. that. That's what well, we talk about it all the time. Like, I'm, I'm, I'll go if I know that there's some sort of astronomical event going on, and I'm going to have view of it from my jacuzzi. I will get up. I would set alarms, and I'll wake up in the middle of the night and keep my jacuzzi and, and go it, and yeah. sit and watch. The Orion did meteor shower, you know, so Orion's boom, right there. And he's mm -hmm. right across the Pleiades and all that, and like telling her stories about the seven sisters, and actually it's nine, and what it, why it was called a seven, and what they would use it for previously as an eye test. And if you could see seven or eight, you were recruited into, as like a scout or an archer into military or something like that. You know, like, and she's just like, it kind of blows her mind, you know. Mm -hmm. And, and she, then she always is telling her friends about the Pleiades as an eye test, you know, she likes to remember that story. <laughs> it's fun, you know. Yeah. It's fun to see which stories they think are cool enough to tell. Yeah, I remember friend. the story of Cassiopeia and the chair. I remember as a child looking up and seeing the chair and imagining this woman sitting in the chair. Yeah. And the archer. That yeah. was the other one. Mm -hmm. Orion looking for the belt. It's my favorite. Yeah. I love Orion. I'm not I don't know a great deal about, about that, but I know those two. Feel worse for the Aborigines in Australia because all their constellations are based off of the the dust uh, that you would see in the Milky Way. So like it looked like shadows. So their their constellations are the inverse of ours. Ours are based on stars, and theirs are based mm. on negative space. But you, with the well, light pollution as that. it is now, you can't. They can't really see the night sky in the way that they did back then. So they can't even see their like. Imagine if you just couldn't see any stars at all ever. Yeah. So in 2001, my husband and I took a cruise from Tahiti to Sydney, Ooh. and we were standing on the the top deck of the Regal Princess, and we saw the Southern Cross. Wow. Yeah. Oh, my God. Right. And he looked at me, he said, are we really here in the South Pacific? I said, I think we are. <laughs> it was that really something. That is great. Yeah. That was amazing. That's great. Good story. I love that. <laughs> All right, I have a good kickoff question that I like. Is um, what's an experience you remember? If you re if it, if it's something that you remember, or do you rem do you not remember engaging in poetry, or do you remember a key moment that got you engaged in poetry, either to become a fan or to actually immediately write, or what what was it? You know, like what took you on the path from fan to writer and it wasn't very long yeah go ahead you go first um that's funny that you should ask because i just brought <laughs> one of the poems that really struck me um and it's a very old poem from 1912 and it's by an english poet named thomas hardy 
and it was the convergence of the twain, which is about lines from the ten Titanic. Hmm. And it really struck me, that poem. Uh, it took me a while to understand it because of the language, yeah. because it's kind of In old. code, yeah. But um, I didn't know where it was going. It left me with a little bit of mystery as it went on. And the last two lines just blew me away. Why don't we hear it? That's well, it's... You want me to read the whole poem? If you'd like. Okay. I'm sure we all brought poetry and we'll converse and chat. And okay. if you're bringing up a poem, we might it's as well hear it. It's called uh, The Convergence of the Twain, Lines on the Loss of the Titanic. In a solitude of the sea, deep from human vanity, and the pride of life that planned her, stilly couches she. Steel chambers late the pyres of her salamandrine fires, cold currents thrid and turn to rhythmic tidal lyres. Over the mirrors meant to glass the opulent, the sea worm crawls, grotesque, slimed, dumb, indifferent. Jewels in joy designed to ravish the sensuous mind lie lightless, all their sparkles bleared and black and blind. Dim mooned eyes, fishes near, gaze at the gilded gear and query, what does this vain gloriousness down here? Well, while was fashioning this creature of cleaving wing, the imminent will that stirs and urges everything prepared a sinister mate for her so gaily great, a shape of ice for the time far and disassociate. And as the small ship grew in stature, grace and you, in shadowy silent distance grew, the iceberg too. Alien they seemed to be, no mortal eye could see the intimate welding of their later history, or sign that they were bent by paths coincident on being a nun, twin halves of one august event. Till the spinner of the years said now and each one hears, and consummation comes and jars two hemispheres. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. That's great. I just love that. That, that last line is so amazing. It just blew me away. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Salamandrin fires. Yeah. Love mm -hmm. that. Is that like underwater? I like almost think of it as like the light you would see of seeing like a fire from that's happening, but mm -hmm. the boat is sinking and seeing it as liquid, you know. Yeah. Mm. And and how he's trying to show how man tries to negotiate nature <laughs> and it can't be done, you know. <laughs> mm. And our pride <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just <laughs> doesn't let loose, you know. We just want to hold on to everything we can. Yeah. Mm. Anyway. Yeah. The the poem that got me going, in, in, unless you wanted to, you know, I don't want to interrupt your... Nothing at all. Um, uh, uh, probably because of my background, I'm very um, conscious of um, injustice. And the first poem that, that came to mind for me was when I was living in Santa Barbara after my divorce. and. Um, it's called Scathing News. Uh, the term third world was brought up by first class people in the first world. Now the second world, even though subordinates far too close to the first and was passed by. Either that or fourth graders had a lot to do with this. Yeah. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> You know, isn't that arrogant, the third world? It I mean, is, what right? the fuck? <laughs> it's just right. so arrogant. You know, it just used to grate on me. And in a class in Santa Barbara one time, I ran into this kid, and we told our names, and he says, Are you Louise Cathcart? And he pulls out that poem. 
had it, and he says, I always carry this with me. Wow. <laughs> I know, yeah. I was thrilled. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Wow. wow. Yeah, so I had an impact on one person. <laughs> well, I think you've had an impact on a lot of people. <laughs> Well, Especially, you, I mean, the things you write about Nebraska oh, have yeah. an impact on me. Oh. Yeah, so, so um, I was an English major. Yeah. And when I was in college, I wrote short stories and some poetry, but mostly short stories. And then what happens? You get married, you have children, you work, and your world kind of goes to everyday things. So why did I start writing poetry? The first poem I wrote was basically right after 9-11. Okay, I wrote it the day after 9-11, and that hadn't written a poem in, well, I was done with school in 65, so that'll tell you. Mm -hmm. I hadn't written a poem in all those years, and I wrote the, that poem, and that would have been in 2001, and my husband died in 2004, and about a year after he died, the dam broke and I started writing poetry, and I started writing a lot of poetry. It was so intense Cathartic. that I would write it at work, and I could not stop. I mean, I had to mm. make a secret folder on my work computer because <laughs> if it came, I, couldn't, I could no more not write it than I could stop breathing. I had to write it. People knew, but just a few, and they, they kind of let it go. I got my work done, but I would all of a sudden say, no, I've got to do this now, and I would write, you know. Right. And then I'd send it home. And when I left that job, <laughs> I had to somehow get it off the computer. <laughs> I'll never forget I had people helping me because, I mean, it, it was a whole huge folder. Wow. Then, and I'd send the stuff home, but evidently you can always find it if, you, if somebody needs to. But anyway, right. so it would have been about, he died in July of 2004, and this would have been about a year and a half later, about like November, December 2006. I really... It was literally like a dam broke, and poems just fell out. Wow. And, and I've been writing ever since, and that's almost 19 years ago. Oof. So that's kind of... Cathartic. It, yeah. There was no poem that started me. I had the poems in me. Mm -hmm. and, um, so 19 years of flow. Yeah, at least. That's yeah. great. Well, he died in... It's actually 18 and a half years since he died, so I'll say 17. I'll, I'll take 17. And I just, uh, at, at first I didn't share with anyone. In the very beginning I wrote poetry but nobody got to hear it. Do you remember which poem of yours was the first that you shared? Yeah, that was the, well, the first poem that I wrote is that I have that, I don't have it on paper but I have it in here. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the poem I wrote that, um, uh, I wrote because, uh, Okay, so one I wrote on, on after, um, this is a brand new phone, I just got it yesterday, so I'm going to have to, if I was available offline. Do you have uh, internet? What uh, is that? What? What kind of phone? Oh! Do you have? I hear they have that on computers now. <laughs> yeah. Great. It's being a wise no, ass. No, I'm just a wise ass. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> no, I'm saying because of I'm, course I, I don't have internet here. If you would be, so, if you don't mind me holding your phone, I can get you all set up, so you can get what you need. It's not an iPhone. That's okay. Okay. <laughs> You're not required to have an iPhone. No, I'm definitely not required to have an iPhone. You don't have an iPhone. <laughs> I have this. Oh. Type. This is my third Pixel. No, my third Google Pixel, and I love it. The only thing I hate about about it is when someone uh, about the integration is that when someone is on a group text f thread like my family is a big family and we have uh, we have like one person or two people that use a, a non iPhone yeah. so then when you send a video into it it's just tiny and all pixelated mm. Yep. And it doesn't look great, and it's basically just because they they refuse to talk to each other. Steve That's arranged it that way, I yeah. think. I don't know. All I know <laughs> is that this thing has the takes the best pictures. That's great. And uh, I, I'm very happy with it. I never wanted an iPhone. Oh. All right. Here of course, you. I've been inheriting from my son. This one I paid for myself. <laughs> my first, my first, first <coughs> phone I've ever had that was my phone. 
You're so lucky you have someone that knows about he, these he, things. You know, he, he complained like hell. He says, I was not born to be your IT tech. I said, yes, you yes, were. You, were. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you just yes, didn't you know it. <laughs> All right, so you just need to finish that up, and then you, the password's in, and you're on my Wi-Fi. Thank you. Um, yeah, I am I am my family's tech support. So. Yeah, <laughs> and, and you know, he was this, I got this phone yesterday. Yes. So, um, no, I got it. A week ago, he set it up yesterday. Yes. So, okay. So, <laughs> so now, am, am I actually on your Wi-Fi? You should be. Okay, thank you. Yeah. The Logan's Rock. That's right. Okay, so we now do. let's mm -hmm. get to that poem. See again, I have um, oh documents. Okay, Joan, where were you? Where, where, what do you remember about um, in being inspired towards poetry or? An, an initial poem you wrote, or anything like that, because like, a lot of times I don't I don't remember exactly wh where it was. I remember I had a notebook full of poetry. Dr. Vanston was my th junior year high school creative writing teacher, and he showed us, you know, kind of free form poetry, and that's what I fell in love with. And he really he really liked my style, and he pushed me really hard in it. Also, was the town mortician. And um, really cool, <laughs> cool guy, you know, really just very interesting dude, <laughs> um, great writer. And uh, I remember he gave me these like rules for poetry. And I remember, I remember he would always say, um, um, adverbs are the bastard modifiers of the English language. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was really funny. <laughs> but I had written so many good poems. This huge, thick notebook was just... It was just like the scribbles of an inspired high school kid, you know, <laughs> just like everything in different angles and stuff mm -hmm. written in the margins and everything. And I lost that book. Mm. Oh, no. I lost oh. that. Like, I think when I moved to L.A., it got lost in a box somewhere. Oh. I've never found it since. And I didn't write for years until I moved here. It must be painful thinking about lost it does, that it's, book. It's like, it's pain. I also lost my, my baseball glove. That was my three older brothers and my uh, older uncle's oh. baseball glove. Yeah. I was like the fifth person to I use can it. Relate I could to roll you. it up and put it in my pocket. It was so soft. Yeah. And and I left it at a, at a ballpark for like ten minutes when that oh. it was gone. Oh. I'm like, why would... It had no padding in it. Yeah. It hurt like heck to yeah. You had to... <laughs> You had to purely catch the ball to have it not hurt. It sounds know? like you should write a poem about this. <laughs> yeah. About that. Oh, there we go. I've been, I've been hurting for years yeah. lately. I can feel the pain from you. Good. Yeah, that leather glove is a good one. That leather glove. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I'm going to have to work on this. Cool it authored by Wheezy and Connor. No. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, what, what do you remember from that, Joan? What, what um, stories I, I remember great... Uh, rhymes when I was a kid, when I was really young, and teachers inspired us to to write tiny little poems. And um, after a while, I started writing, but you know, I threw them all away. Hmm. I just wrote them and looked at them and said, "Oh, that's nice," and threw them away. It wasn't until I want to say I graduated, <laughs> I got my AA degree when I was 65. <laughs> at Ventura College and I took a poetry class. That's great. Mm -hmm. And wow. um, I started writing then. And, wow. and then um, I got involved in going to readings and um, open mics and became part of a group in Moore Park College which was um, pretty cool because it was a generational Kind there was no gap. There were the students, and there was this older generation of people that were merged together by a woman called Sandra Hunter, and oh, she was yeah. a teacher there. Yeah. And um, she, we formed a, a group called the Razor Babes, and we performed poetry. And we got to San Francisco, we got to places, uh, Central Coast, wow. and. Um, we just had a lot of fun while we were doing it. A revival, that's what I want. Yes, a revival. revival. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is the poem that I wrote on September 12th. Oh. Right. Yes. When Tuesday's darkness fills me up, and I know we must deal with death, I worry for the children's thoughts, their minds, their lives, their need for breath. How do you tell a child that men kill men and women of many faiths, 
kill people with a missile plane with one great blow, 5,000 deaths. A parent tries to shield his child to keep each small one safe from harm. The world we knew, knew no longer mild. We watch the future with alarm. Mm -hmm. And yet we have a bigger task to stop the foe, to right the wrong. With freedom force we may not ask, we must show all that we are strong. Our lives disrupted, haven bared. We know secure and safe. We knew safe and se we knew secure and safe abode. The swiftness of a foe unseen has brought a sour's a sorrow's heavy load. But we must win. Must bridge the gap. We owe it to our children now. Let freedom ring with passion's light. But just right now, don't ask me how. Mm -hmm. And that was the first poem I wrote after 35 years. So that, and then, and I sent this poem, this is interesting. I wrote that poem and then I got a, a thing in the mail from one of these vanity things saying, would you like to put in a poem? And I put this poem in and they made it the first poem in the book. Wow. So I got, you know, and you pay like, I don't know, $30 and you get this book. And so I have this book. And it's my poem is the first poem in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, we got affirmation. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. And then, as I said, I think that was percolating, that whole thing. And then when my husband died and I had a lot of emotions, I think that the reason I had all this stuff pent up was because you go through grief, but you don't, it's very hard to process. And this was one of the ways I processed my grief mm -hmm. uh, was through poetry, and I wrote all these poems. I mean, and now I look at them; they're so simple and stupid, and I rewrite them all, you know. But at that time, it, it was a, a, a very tool, a great, great tool. tool, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that started me. So that was in two thousand and five or six or whenever it was, and I really didn't share these with anybody until. I, start, I, I joined an online poetry group called allpoetry.com. And there, everything's online, so you can share with people, but they're not right there, you know. And I did that for a while, and then the guy that I was living with, <laughs> this is actually quite funny, he put an ad on Craigslist because he wanted a male friend. Now, if you were a man and you saw a, a, a thing on Craigslist asking, you would think it was probably, you know, homosexual. It wasn't. He was looking for somebody to have coffee with. <laughs> anyway, so this guy responded, realized it wasn't that, and he wasn't looking for that. He didn't like my friend. He didn't like Craig. Craig was his name. He didn't like Craig. But he was a poet, okay? And he took a class from Doris whatever her name was, the woman that... Vernon. Vernon. And he said, you should take this class from Doris Vernon. And he got me in with Doris Vernon. I then... And he said, you should come to Thursday night in Ventura. <laughs> I show up at Thursday night in Ventura with Craig, and I meet Sandra, and Sandra says, you should take this class in Malibu. This, this all happened. Talk about the flow. Uh, so I started taking the class in June... It would have been June of 16. And okay. uh, and she's still taking it. She, well, she hasn't taken it since. Oh, no, you won't. I'm still taking it. <laughs> but what happened was that was my entry into the poetry world here. Even though I'd been right. writing a lot, I started going to poetry readings. I started reading. Um, and I became, you know, came to know these ladies and a lot of other people in poetry that I didn't know started reading for, uh, you know, going to that. And mm -hmm. we, we also started something at the UU called Muses, but it never really took off. This is much better because this guy knows what he's doing. Um, so that that kind of was the whole, it kind of just built on everything. But this thing about him sending, putting this thing on, on, on Craigslist, it was just, he was a weird guy. And, and, <laughs> and this guy, it was the guy who, I can't remember this his is name. A good story. I can't remember this guy's name, but you'd know him if you saw him. He was, uh, he, he lived in, in Portland, Oregon for a while. And he would come back periodically. I don't know whatever happened to him. He's gone. He doesn't live around here anymore. But he was to come to Thursday Night Poetry. And, um, and that's that. I have. We ended up there. I met Sandra. She said I should go to the class. I went to the class. Started going on Thursday nights, and boom, you know, it just went on from there. So that was sixteen. 
Yeah. That was a year later, and it was because Ken and hosting the Newberry Park branch. Right, oh, Ken. You know, I just moved. We moved in here uh, July of seventeen, and I just I saw poetry, and I'm like, I will go do that. Well, you know, Ken really, uh, when he started the Wednesday night things, I said to him. Ken, I hate you. I can't come on Wednesday nights. I did, because I can't. I'm going to read on the 9th, but I'm not doing what I normally do on, on Wednesday nights. And they have to fend for themselves, because I can't. It was Ken's energy as an MC yeah. and his warmth. Yeah, his yeah. and his yeah. voice. Seeing, and it was seeing Ron get voice. up and recite right. instead of read from mm -hmm. his poetry. Well, you, you, and, and do it in such a way that... It, it, and, and Ken is an part amazing of the reason poet. Why I got, got into this mm -hmm. and read a lot, because you, you deliver good mm -hmm. poetry. Mm -hmm. and He's and an amazing that. poet, too. Yeah, I love his work, poet. because he was a physics teacher. Mm -hmm. So you would get yeah. these, really? these wonderful mixed science and poet and he has yeah. this funny way of kind of pausing and he'd get this oh, look in his eyes you know <laughs> and I think this so great. let's all talk about Ron <laughs> 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 we're talking Ken this is Ken oh you're talking about Ken yeah Good. well I I would think of the same sentiments but yes Ken Ken's warmer <laughs> <laughs> Ken, Ken is, was on this podcast remotely from 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 uh, England, from England which was great, yeah. and we had such a good time. I think he was up at like four in the morning or something like that. Yeah. we were doing it, and he's quite and a guy. We all I heard guy. that one. Yeah, yeah. I, I the the thought of him. Connor, you should join on the third uh, Wednesday of every month. Yeah, at ten thirty our time. He has to work. Oh. Uh, Ken has a. I, it's, it's during the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah, sorry. yeah. Yeah, third Thursday. I'm usually working. Wednesday. Yeah, Wednesday. 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 Third Wednesday. Wednesday. Yeah. I've never gone on, and I really, I should, but I, yeah. maybe yeah. I will now that I'm not. They just had a bunch of Polish from Poland. You know, oh. it was so interesting hearing other cultures too. Oh, I, I should have heard that. I think I'm they Polish. And I, uh, I would like that. When I heard that Ken was moving, I was I was really moved. Oh yeah, sad I love him, because yeah. I really liked his stuff, and he he would also come to Thursday night, and he would read these great poems. You know. It was his performance. Yeah, he, That's, a, he is just yeah. stellar when it comes to performing. Yeah, he's got this poem about the starlings and the patterns. He's so interesting. They go. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Hmm. And, and you know, I'm a great believer that each poet has a voice, and the voice comes through. You can't, you can't write poet li like someone else. You can't. I've tried, and I can't do it. I, I can't write like Joan, I can't write like Wheezy, but I know their poetry. I hear it and I know, I mean, hers is always so full of these images of her childhood and stuff, and hers is kind of like a little bit, you know. <laughs> I, it's just Joan is a more intellectual. She's always yeah. correct. I mean, me and English are strangers, sort of. <laughs> so well, we have, I do, English and I. <laughs> yeah. It's just interesting. I write very straightforward stuff. It's very. Um, uh, I, I've tried to figure out what, do, where, how do I write poetry? And what I do is I have a vision in my head, and I put it up in front of me, and I look at it, and I write from that picture. Hmm. And that's how I write, and it's really simple. It's not there are not a lot of curly cues and stuff. And sometimes it sounds more prosy than poetry, but that's that's what comes out. I had done not quite done with it, I don't think, but I had done these series about I think I'm probably about ten or twelve of them now of poems from where I grew up in Pennsylvania, from the property that I grew up on, and. Those all came as that way. Like they're they're um, they're a, a three dimensional color image in my mind that I can move around within, but it's from a specific rooted position that I'm looking at. Like I'll be looking across our pond at a weeping willow tree, or the other one is that I'm at this uh, crossing point of two old logging trails in the woods. It's a um, moment in yeah. time. It's a moment in time yeah. where like. Like I remember, I was when I stopped, and I remember that moment in the woods. I remember like three steps prior, I had like cracked a, you know, stepped on and cracked a really crisp, dry branch, you know, and like the leaves crunched, and then I stopped for a second, and that's that's when I remember that spot there, you know. I think that, uh, and each person has, is is moved by different stimuli, mm -hmm. and that's the Definitely. thing that's so interesting about poetry. 
I've been having this discussion with this guy that I'm dating. He's he's a writer, but he's he's spent his whole life writing uh, nonfiction, and mm-hmm. he, that's he made his living writing nonfiction. And he asked me, well, why why poetry? What what's what's so different about poetry? And I said, I think it has to do with that poetry pushes different emotion with buttons. Mm. It, it, uh, yeah, you can get a lot out of prose, but it doesn't do the same thing. It doesn't get to the mm-hmm. point. That's what I love about yeah. poetry. So, mm-hmm. zap. <laughs> kind of like acupuncture. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yes, right. Ooh, mm-hmm. there's a connection here. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and well, what like about you? Do you remember a specific point in time that got you stoked? Um, I'm racking my brain. What I remember is I used to have this orange folder. I think this was in high school. And on it, I had drawn a picture because I had heard that, you know, what's the definition of poetry? Well, poetry causes the top of your head to come off. And you just sort That's of. That's Dickinson. Yeah. Is it? Very yeah. Dickinson. Okay. So I had actually drawn that. I drew, you know, a male face with a hinge on the head and so the top of the head was cracking open mm-hmm. and all this stuff was coming out. Mm-hmm. Poetry so, can change you. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can hear something and go, oh, oh, okay. So that, that's really it. the earliest memory mm-hmm. I have. Yeah. Huh. It's very therapeutic, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. In fact, uh, this, this poem here, it's sort of, I've been obsessed with therapy and getting healed mm-hmm. all my life and um, uh, Anyway, should I read this? It's just real short. Um, uh, The name of this is The Way Out is the Way Through. There's been decades I haven't rested, nor feasted on my flame. Things neglected return with added pain. But as I sit here across from you, getting lost in our connection, all that seems remote, unimportant. More than one way to heal a wound, release the pain, cauterize the soul. Respond to the moment, a blissful place to hide. No healing required, no pouring out my heart in my endless fucking tail. (laughs) (laughs) This is so you, really. Yes, it is. (laughs) Just to remind everybody in the end that you're a little pissed off. There was a therapist in the old days, uh, he's now dead, the greatest therapist that ever lived, David Viscott. He charged $5,000 for three sessions. My husband knew the kind of pain I was in and he said, go ahead. I went in to see him, I told him my story, foster parents, blah, blah, blah. And Viscott said, oh, it was always bullshit from the beginning. What do you mean? I mean, he changed my life. In in 45 minutes, I was a different person. Wake up! <laughs> no, it's, it's, okay. Wake up! It's, it's kind of like this idea that you, until you're 21, you can blame everything on your parents, right? <laughs> but the minute you turn 21, yeah. you become an adult, and then you have yourself to blame. Yeah. I mean, it's very basic, but yeah. in, a, in, a, in a way... That's what you have to do. You have to get past it. Somehow. Yeah, yeah. And he helped me. I mean, he says it was never any good. I was raised by foster parents, my mother, blah, 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 da, 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 da. Anyway, so it, it never occurred to me that it was never any good. And I just let it go. Just let it go. And so, <laughs> nice sitting across. Being in the present moment, you know, they talk about that in the Being 60s. In the, in the here and now, that's yeah. the answer. It is the answer. It is the answer. It it's is the, the answer. answer. <laughs> Live but, in the now. Yeah. Was it Goethe said, uh, there's nothing more important than this day? I'm sorry, what? He yes. said, there's nothing more important than this day. Yeah, mm-hmm. this moment, this day, this, mm-hmm. this being here and really being present, not worrying about this or that from the right. past. So. It's so interesting because that's... That's kind of what's made my life different. Is I, I stopped worrying about what happened before, and I don't worry about what's going to happen. Uh, and I really do exist right here, right now, for this moment. And and I I work at that because otherwise, 
I could get lost in losing my husband when I was 59 mm -hmm. after 35 years or having men that died all around mm -hmm. me, which they did. You know, Marcy, that's why I say a blissful place to hide. Yeah. Because it'll be back again. Yeah. And then you got to let it go all over again. Yeah, you know, <laughs> and you just keep, you keep fighting to stay where you are and not let the, well, when you think, when you try and, when, when you try and future fuck, which is what I call it, <laughs> what happens is you're trying to make something happen or you think it's going to happen and most of the time you're wrong and you can't do anything about it anyway so what you're right. doing is wasting your energy right. that you could be using right now to sit and talk to four or five under wonderful people about interesting stuff yeah. because if I were, instead of being here, if I were thinking, well, gosh, I'm 77, mm -hmm. I might be dead in five years. I might be dead next week. I could be hit by a beer truck when I walk out on Bear Creek. I could do that, but what a waste of energy, what? literally. Why a beer truck? Because my husband was Danish. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're absolutely, I don't mean to be flip about it. I get it. I, 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 um, That's what he used to say. I, I, I tell it to my daughter, I say, don't don't create concrete statues to how you think something should Cause be. Because it never is going to work that way. Because like, you spend a lot of time oh, maintaining just that Just waste statue. of time. <laughs> just no, being in the moment is what he used you to would. say that. He used to say, I could, I could walk out and be hit by a right. truck. Be ready for the statue that presents itself. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and yeah. appreciate it. Or, or just let it, let the, yeah. let the future happen as it happens. Because you can't do very much about it. There are some things you have to plan. You've got to plan to have some money when you're old. Right. You've got to think about that if you have no food in the house, you're not going to be able to eat. Correct. I mean, but it's not that. It's this kind of, oh my God, what happens if he no longer loves me in 10 years? Or... What am I going to do if I'm alone? And, and you can just, you can blow your mind right. worrying about stuff that probably will never happen. And if it does, you'll have to worry about it then because you can't do anything about it in advance. We try to control the world around us. We try to make the world meet what we think will make us comfortable, and we can't do it. We can't do it. I think, we, I think probably we all struggle this, with that as poets. Um, when trying too hard to control how a message will land, because I don't think mm -hmm. you can do that. You know, because everybody's perception, their own colors, you are can, looking you at. You control things. your intention yeah. as much as you care to, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but, but how the words hit the ears of yeah. whomever will have a different. Will have a different. Uh, just a different. Energy. Exactly yeah, you right. Can actually. You can affect it, though, and we do that when we have critique. Well, that's what I think good poetry is. It yeah. elicits the, a normalized response across the greatest swath of humanity, mm -hmm. right? They, so the yeah. greatest poets may, make every, in the same thing with, that's why the Beatles are great, or, you know, it's why, uh, wh whatever, why, that's why a, a piece of art is, is so wonderful to, some, to so many people is because it elicits the same similar same type of response at the, the largest matches. amount of people right so, so when we get together for critique um often you know we talk we read a poem and someone says you know that word took me out mm -hmm. it took me away from what you were saying huh you need to look at it because it doesn't fit the rest of it or you need a softer word you need a harsher word you need a more um descriptive word because that particular word, instead of thinking about what you were talking about, I thought about X, which has nothing to do with this. So you can shape to a certain extent, not perfectly, and you wouldn't want to. Because as you said, each person is going to hear it, it's going to go in how it goes in, and they're going to assimilate it in the way they assimilate it. Right. Mm -hmm. hmm. Connor, has there been a poem that's changed? the way you look at the world after hearing it? When singing songs of scariness and ugliness and hairiness, I regret to f uh, inform you that at this very moment of the most chilling one of all, 3,000 pounds and nine feet tall, the, s the scurvy, glurvy skagagraw that's standing right behind you. <laughs> <laughs> That'll do, that'll do it. That's, a, that's the worst. It's Shel Silverstein. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it sounds like Shel Silverstein. Yeah. yeah, and that's my favorite one. It's the best. 
I, li- I always like uh, in, in Sarah Sylvia Cynthia Stout, so who would not take the garbage wouldn't out. Wouldn't take the garbage yes, out. I used to recite that poem back and forth. Shel Silverstein first got me into it for sure, in Winnie the Pooh for sure. Um, and then my mom just singing songs about whatever the fuck she was doing in the house at the time. <laughs> She'd sing a song about washing dishes or putting away clothes or how, you, you know, changing diapers. Doobies up and doobies down, you know, and doobies go all around the town, you know. <laughs> Everything was little songs that she'd come up with and they had they would rhyme or not, or not make sense at all or anything, but they'd be fun, you know. Mm-hmm. And and so I sing all those same songs. I sing everything I'm doing in the freaking house. You know? Oh, it's, interesting. It's, yeah, I'm like, my whole life is a song if if the if nobody's looking at me <laughs> even when they are so how many kids do you have two uh-huh. two um uh oh that reminds me yeah. of a a situation I, I was in a group of us decided to um work with the ventura uh educational department and we would present little pieces to grades from kindergarten to 12 and uh, we presented stuff to the kids and then we'd have them do their own poetry and have an open mic and the kids loved that Mm -hmm. so some of the teachers were very nice they made them do homework afterward they would say well we got to send a letter to these poets that came so either write a letter or make a little poem, we're going to put it in a book. And I've gotten a few of those. Well, one day, I get this in the mail, I couldn't believe it. There was this pretty pretty substantial amount of poetry from these kids with drawings. And then this one girl said, Dear poetry ladies, thank you so much for coming to our class. We had a good time. Um... But I know you had to leave because you must be very tired because you're so old. (laughs) (laughs) We loved it. We just loved it. (laughs) Unvarnished. Speaking speaking of old and, um, you know, Phil and Marcia, you know, Phil Taggart and yeah. Marcia Dillo, oh, did this wonderful series called uh, Letting the World Know We Lived, mm. which was older yeah. people mm-hmm. telling their story of something in their life, because the idea was that COVID was killing people off left and right, and some of these people might not survive COVID, so they, they gathered up a bunch of older people and had them tell a story, generally in, in the form of poetry, and they did these these uh, videos, and they're amazing. They're mm. just amazing. They're on uh, YouTube? Ventura County mm. Poetry, whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, so then, they, then they took them to kids. I don't know if they were in high school or college. High school. High school. Mm-hmm. And then they shared them with the kids and had the kids talk about their experiences. And the the intention is at one or another point, I don't know if it'll ever happen, for the older people and the kids to get together. And I don't know if it'll ever happen, but I just thought that was so... What a great idea. Yeah. We, we showed those videos as part of our feature at Thousand Oaks a month ago, September. Oh, really? It was. Yeah. Oh. And it was great because the, the kids were reacting to That's the, right. Yeah, to, I'd love to, to see their that. mentors. Yeah. Mm. Well, they're on. They're on uh, YouTube. Yeah. And I think they're all under Ventura County Poetry Project. Yeah. yeah. I think it's called Dear America. It, it, w- w- letting That's the world great. know we live. There you go. I did one of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Jean I did Colomos, it in this. Col- mm-hmm. Jean A lot of people. Yeah. A lot of people uh, that got Russ Austin or Russ whatever the the dark guy, the black guy. Did a, did oh yeah, yeah. Um, from Cal Jerry Lutheran. Garcia, not that Jerry, or the other Jerry Garcia, right. a whole bunch of people, and it was they were so different. Different people have such different things that they say, you know. And I, um, I remember going to the studio. He has the studio that because he teaches at Ventura College, mm-hmm. he teaches their video audio stuff, and it was very professional, uh, and. I look at it today and think, wow, gosh, you know, <laughs> it's kind of cool, you know. Right. 
Absolutely. But you know, we failed to give a, a real shout out to people like Marsha and Phil Taggart. Oh my God, they've done so much. And Ron here. So hard, yeah. And Ken and, and Connor all the, <laughs> and Connor and people that volunteer their time to, to this stuff. promote this art yeah. of ours because actually we're yeah. Oh, I mean, a lot of us get together because yeah. we're in a community, but there are times when you can go weeks and not even be outside of your yeah. home because you're yeah. writing. I and thank God for this and, and bridge. Yeah. And that's why I want you all <laughs> to come bridge. to the open <laughs> mic. Yeah, I play Share bridge. your poetry <laughs> yeah. with non-poets. That's the thing I'm trying to do is get mm -hmm. people to don't normally go to stuff because right. people are coming from UU to this thing. Right. And they're enjoying it. They really are. It's a great get, place to put your passion, you know. I get especially excited when someone comes in that's like that's younger than me, that's like writing really well. And yeah. there was that one gentleman that showed up at the last reading. Wow, he was fantastic. I hope he comes back. He was really great. I think his name is Max. 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 Actually I'm yeah. I'm emailing him so that guy was we'll get him in here, yeah. Yeah, that guy was Great, really blew me away, and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you know when people come in and they show interest, I think it's especially profound to me when it's someone that shows up by themselves. And it tends to be that way with mm -hmm. po poetry. Yeah. I think poetry is so mm -hmm. personal yeah. mm -hmm. that when you go, you make your initial foray to go out, you usually don't bring anybody that knows you along. Right, well, because yeah. you don't right. want to be embarrassed. Mm -hmm. Right, I think the same thing. Like if I went and tried to do stand up comedy, yeah. I, I would I would never even tell my wife I'd yeah. be like, oh, I gotta go yeah, to a yeah. band practice <laughs> or something, and I'd go try. Got a dentist yeah. appointment. And probably, yeah, I'd probably go and bomb somewhere and come back and never mention anything <laughs> yeah, yeah. about it. <laughs> well, that's why all those years I didn't really share. I wrote all this stuff and nobody ever yeah. saw it. I never shared it with anyone. Wow. Because I didn't feel that, you know, and, and and that took yeah. consider I started writing in two thousand six and I didn't even go online with it until thirteen. So that was a lot of time of the few people around me maybe knew at work and stuff, but I'm really sure that I remember uh, and th th these are, this is a cool discussion because I, I remember now I remember what brought me back because it wasn't just coming to Newberry Park um, and going to the poetry group. I had actually written a couple of things maybe like two or three poems in that year prior and started writing poems and then and then found this and was really excited about it and I, one thing that really led to it was I was up in Seattle recording an album with my friends and um, it came the time music. to write yeah and it came time to write um, lyrics and the guitar player one of my best friends and the singer uh, he was very um, the, the lyrics were his thing, you know, mm -hmm. and he's going to do that. And and I showed him some poetry that I had written, and um, and he used some of my poetry in mm -hmm. one of our songs. And that really, it, and it was this this short little poem, but he uh, he used the first stanza of it. But um, and this was the first thing I wrote after losing that book, right? Wow. Oh, and this is the first oh, thing wow. I wrote because I lost that book. I was probably twenty-one when I when it was gone, or twenty. And then this is me at thirty-eight, coming back to writing. I'm, you still look twenty-one, so I don't know what happened there, but <laughs> yes, thank you, that, <laughs> yeah. That's right. That's right. Good living. Um, Tethers know not their worth. Each strand complies alongside the next. Brittle if alone, steel as a whole. Precise opposites, yet each is viewed as its truth. The blade easily plucked is music maker or food. If held too tightly, it sings not. Is the field binding the earth any different in purposeful togetherness? Blade and tether are equals, and it is utility that becomes a memory. Wow. Mm -hmm. And it's good. Well. I still love that poem. Yeah. I wrote that in forty-five seconds, and I've never changed a word. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes, lots of that. times, it comes mm -hmm. real fast. It just falls out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you, you've got to. That was what was happening when I was at work. I would get this thought, and I would try to work, and I couldn't until I got it written. I couldn't. I couldn't do anything, and I, I, I just, and I was terrified that I would get caught because this was a very conservative insurance. <laughs> Agency right. and and but what are you doing? You writing poetry? <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, but it's true. If you've got something, that's why they say you should sleep with 
pad of paper by your bed yeah. and a pen, though I've never really done that and gotten up and written something down. But The shower works for me. <laughs> <laughs> what I love is um, I love the water. notes on water. your phone and dictation oh, yeah. now is such a huge deal because it's coming in my head, and I can s speak mm -hmm. out the muse faster than I can write it down. Yes, you have and so microphone. I don't even care if I just get the words wrong. I just like blurt out everything I can think of, and at least it's down. Yeah. Now I have something. Well, I that can is start. something I have to figure out. Is how I'm oh, sure great. this exists. Yeah. My yeah. son says you can you can basically get you can you can keep anything. Right. It's so fast that the the AI is so good now. So you hand him your phone and you say, prove it. Yeah, <laughs> he did. That's exact, but he did it so fast I didn't get it. I mean, I know how to do it. I don't know where to keep it. Hmm. Notes. Know, right, 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 right. No, but yeah. remember, I don't have an iPhone. Oh, oh. So I have to figure out where on a... Oh. I'm she sure doesn't have an iPhone. Not, <laughs> but I, I will figure it out. <laughs> I have to ask you, what what's what here? Oh. The that other side. <laughs> yes, that one. I remember. I did get it here. Um, it is. It says, "Travel is fatal to prejudice." Oh, that's, true. Uh, that's that is a uh, Samuel Clemens quote. Okay. Uh -huh. yeah. I got it uh, the day before I left on, true on, that on, is. on a tour, you know, uh -huh. and I was just like, you know, more see the world, more you understand people's points Absolutely. of view. Absolutely. Right? Okay. And it's also, selfishly, a very good barometer of the intelligence of people you meet at parties, you know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, what's that? Yeah. Oh, prejudice? What are you, prejudice? That's so, so. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Next. Next. <laughs> yeah, then move on. Right. The, Next. The oh, intelligence okay. barometer or something like that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, no, but I, I love this tattoo. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice. And I, you know, see I've a lot of people with words before, around your elbow. You know, it's yeah. kind of a unique spot, too. I like that. So. I'm glad you brought that up. I totally forgot. I totally <laughs> forgot about I'm that. I'm going, that. what is that? I looked up the wrong <laughs> elbow. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> It's better than a tramp stamp. Yes. Oh, jeepers, creepers. I feel bad for you know, all my my female friends between the age of 39 and 47 <laughs> have those tattoos. Yeah. Yeah. Or or they have a butterfly on their ankle. Right. Yeah. Very class. Very classic. Yeah. Very classic. Yeah. My daughter, when she was 18, went away to school at Santa Cruz, and it has definitely changed her life. She is very definitely from Santa, you know, from UC Santa Cruz. And she did a paper on tattoos. Yeah. And somehow that convinced her to get a tattoo. Now this is, my daughter is 54. Yes. Okay. So it, this was not that common at that time. And she told me about it. She said, but no one will ever see it unless I want them to. <laughs> oh. It's planted right in the middle of one of her butt cheeks. So <laughs> it isn't something that you see. I mean, it, even if she wore a bikini, right. it would be covered. So she was, she was really very discreet about it. But I was, I, I was kind of horrified. I can tell you. <laughs> you got a what? <laughs> a tattoo? <laughs> you know, like, now you go to the gym and these people are like, from head to toe, covered with ink. My uh, my niece came out to visit us when she was in high school, and we were still living in Hollywood, like right in the middle, of, like Fountain and Highland, right in the middle of Hollywood. Oh wow! And uh, this is like two thousand, uh, about two thousand twelve or something like that. And uh, she came. And she's like, Uncle Connor, I want to get a tattoo. I was like, I, I got you. And <laughs> and because like I had my fr I had a bunch of friends that are pr real good professional tattoo artists and. And so she went and got a tattoo, and she explained what she wanted, and I was like, okay, your mom's not going to kill me for that. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but think about it. was under the yeah. hair, on the back of the neck, and it was so the, the the bass clef and the treble clef and, oh. and so it was a heart. <laughs> I know, think that, was, if I were to get a tattoo, I think I would get a treble clef. Yeah. That would be a perfect tattoo. A what? Right. A treble clef. <laughs> yeah. I know what I want. Breathe. 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 Just a little you know, it, it's <laughs> taken me a long time not to get out of breath when I read poetry. I mean, oh, oh yeah. yeah, I used to get up there and hyperventilate. And, oh yeah, breathe. <laughs> the funny thing is, uh, I was a teacher. I was trained as a teacher. I only taught for a short time. I've never been afraid. Never been afraid to. Uh, Read a poem. Mm. It's it's absolutely natural to me. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's what well, I was. Yeah. Re recently started singing solos, but that is a different thing. <laughs> I mean, I've always sung, but I've never been a solo singer. So, standing up in front of a mic and singing 
like I did. Mm -hmm. That is, I, I'm not quite yeah, so sure scary. about that. Yeah. <laughs> My, uh, my right before right, you you all arrived here today, my wife was in here practicing the song. So when COVID hit, bored out of our minds. So it was April of 2020. I started with like what we call the COVID Smile Jam. And it was yeah, every Friday. I read about it. I yeah, didn't know who yeah. you were. And, and I didn't realize right away that yeah. that was the same person that you were working with. Are you still yeah. doing that, Connor? Yeah, well, yeah, but I mean, it, we we did like probably about 90 concerts in the last, yeah. you know, since April 2020. Mm -hmm. We did that, 2020 we did through until Thanksgiving and then we stopped. It just mm -hmm. got too dark and cold and we started again in like March or April of 2021 and went through the, to Halloween and stopped. Mm -hmm. And then brought it back in March of this year, but people got stuff to do. Yeah, yeah. People weren't out really there, yeah. coming out for it as much or anything. And I just said, you know what, it's, it's you know, certain his purpose, and then you know, a month later, people are knocking on my door. Where's what the jam? What the hell? Yeah, you know? Well, why weren't you there when we were doing it? You know, and I, I said we'll just do a couple key spots. So we did right. like July Fourth weekend. We did like Labor Day, and then we're gonna do we do a big one on Halloween. So next weekend we'll Maybe do it. Maybe I'll be next, out next there because I really six I you know I live in next Denver. Saturday. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And and therefore, of course, I hear about it. Yeah. And you know, I I never never made it and I'm thinking oh that was really now that I know who you are and that you're the Connor that's involved with Ron and the, right. it, it, it everything kind of gelled Ron wrote, wrote a really good poem about the, the May I read it? Yes. 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 Oh, yes. 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 I did <laughs> and just to keep my lawyer off my back this is copyright 2021 Ron Fullerton all rights reserved there you all go. right. I'll, I'll, I'll hear you, man. For all of us today, that all at least the poem that I wrote was a, is a published poem as well. I'm not sure of your poems, but everything everything that we're reading on on this today is the express right of the person who who read that piece. Uh, thank you. Yeah. So this is called "I Hear a Garage Band Playing in the Distance." <laughs> it calls me back to the neighborhood where I once lived. As soon as I hear that faraway drummer. Suddenly, I'm pedaling my bike again as fast as I can. And once again, my heart is like a wheel. As I get closer, I see all the cars and all the girls. I smell thick smoke rising from all the faithful, drawn to that same magic flame. Though I can't make out the lyrics, somehow deep down, I understand. Just one more time, just for tonight, let me stand next to your fire. Is it the bass pounding on my chest or the amp lights glowing in the dark? A white coil cord or a maple neck guitar? Whatever it is, that night put a spell on me. I know I can never pedal fast enough, but somehow I still need to try to get back to where I once belong. Excuse me. While I kiss the sky. No. Oh, that's <laughs> wow. great. I love that one. That's really good. Yeah. He read that here at one, I think it was in 2021. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that was great. I had just been to one of his his COVID jams and it reminded me of that neighborhood band. So a week from today you're doing it. A week from yesterday. So the twenty Saturday the 29th. Oh, oh yeah, this is Sunday, yeah. 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 All what time? Yeah, what time? Six o'clock we okay. start, and we are very prompt. I start right at six, okay. and we'll go. We'll go. We'll probably be done playing by like seven forty-five. So where do you set up on your uh, driveway? Right, the, the drums are inside the, the where the garage, where the, where the, the chalk is, is, all that chalk. The driveway <laughs> is the You've stage. Got a big area right. there. Yeah, actually. it's a big area. Yeah, I, I, set I all thought up. you were at the park. No. Um, the uh, neighbor down the street, Steve Gunner, he on his birthday, like once a year, he'll play, and his house is right across the street from yeah. the park, and so he'll he'll play. I mean, he's super pro musician, you know, he's yeah. touring seasoned guy. Sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. You're gonna be there. Oh yeah, it's a I good time. Yeah. Yeah. And and uh, and this one, the, the the Halloween one, everybody's in costume, and everybody comes cool. in costume, and the neighbors across the street. Throw a big party, and there'll be a well, bunch there's of a lot of stuff. Here. We notice there's a lot of Halloween stuff around here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The yeah. people go. They, they, they go all out with their decorating on their houses and stuff like that. So when I was in college, which was in the '60s, I every Friday night there was a hoot, and I'm a folk music. I'm a folky, mm -hmm. and I got together with a guy who who was a hillbilly, uh, and played every instrument there was. Couldn't sing worth shit, but I could sing. And we started singing at folk festivals. And uh, this was in Ohio. So we would go to Cincinnati and we would go to Middletown and we would go to, you know, uh, 
Fort Wayne, Indiana, and you know Covington, Kentucky, and we would sing at these folk festivals. Yeah. And that's got that same feel that what you're talking about, that feeling of all these kind of shaggy people that get together and and um, it wasn't really all country. It was it was it was like Doc Watson, but it was also Gordon Lightfoot, and it was also mm-hmm. you know uh, Ian McEwen and, and and Peggy Peggy uh, all the, the the folky folkies, not yeah. not the Kingston Trio, more the the I would call them more authentic folk music. Yeah, and that's still the genre I, I still love. I, I sing other stuff, but I still really love folk music. Oh. That's that's kind of, and I don't think you can ever get, you can't. I, I was talking to this guy that I'm seeing, and he knows all about today's music. I know nothing about today's music. Not, it doesn't. I don't even. Uh, it, he says the Green Hill, and I said, "What's that?" You know, oh, they're this, you know, or the. He, he names these places, these different groups, and I have no idea what they are. The ones I know are the folk music people from the 60s and 70s. So, Connor, do you have a hero? Who, who do you like in music? Oh, wow. That is great. Um, How long do you have, right? Well, could, one, one, thing, the one thing about the, the Smile Jam, it was like a little differentiator, is because it was done under COVID, we couldn't get together to rehearse. So the rule was, we don't rehearse. Uh, I just play. Yeah. So, but like the thing is, everybody around here, they, they, they know their stuff. It's either ex-heads that used to, used to be touring guys like me, you know, that can play their instrument competently, right? And that we can all trust each other. It was just pe- positive peer oh, pressure. Fun. Everybody come they, having done their homework. And I would say, like, the, the mantra for it was like, hey, sometimes it's awesome, and sometimes it's really awesome. <laughs> you know? and, so, and, and, and so that's kind of like the, the mantra of the jam. You know, so, so, you know maybe one, so, one song out of every three or four, you know, one song a month will be a train wreck. Mm. But everything else is really pretty, pretty good. Cool, pretty darn good. Yeah, people and, don't know it's a train wreck. And some and some kids, you know, like one kid, David, who's fourteen when he started jamming with us in two thousand twenty. He's seventeen now. We're very good friends. He started the band. He's learned six other instruments because of it, and loves wow. it and what loves an jamming. Mm. You know, and uh, and and like. Two other local bands have started because of the jam. So like and but so you've really you you, know. you seated yeah you seated new yeah. musicians yeah. and that's you have a singer now that uh, My, yeah so favorite musicians now I um, I grew up I'm the youngest of seven so I grew up in the eighties but with seventies tastes so okay, yeah. usually my, great music in my, the seventies singer songwriter yeah for me it's Roger Waters from Pink Floyd for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I really like the band Yes a lot as well. Um, I really love the Police. Stuart oh, yeah. Copeland as a drummer is probably is he my still playing? Drummer. Oh yeah, he is. He is great. And then I grew up listening to a lot of, like harder rock and, and and punk rock and and stuff like that. So, um, but but um, I would say probably like Prince is one of my favorite Ooh, artists. Oh, what time. a guitarist he was! Oh, oh man, my God. I think if I if I had made it as a super popular mega musician, if that had happened for me, I would have a I would have a um, a mindset and heart for it that is kind of like a mixture of Prince and Dave Grohl, like a very appreciative for the 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 blessing of becoming a, of getting paid to be a musician and having some some fame around it yeah. too and stuff like that and just being really happy and wanting to be the water that floats all it, boats it broke my heart when steve perry quit oh jerry oh, i yeah. loved him so much I oh god voice. what a voice yeah yeah uh, um freddie mercury is probably oh, number yeah. one i love queen a lot. Yeah. So, That's right. made a billion dollars, I think, that, that uh, right. movie. And then in terms of like how I approach songs when I'm writing by myself, I really like, um, I listen to a lot, and I've got a bunch of records of them, I l- like the Mills Brothers. Oh, I oh I, I love them. I listen to oh my the God. Mills Brothers a lot. Oh, and so they, mellow. Oh. And when I, when I, um, I would say probably my favorite song of all time is their version of that song, Moon Glow. Like oh. if I'm gonna get my wife to dance with me to a song, uh. it's Moon Glow, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's my. Favorite. I haven't heard that the, that name for a long, long time, but I loved him too. Much. Yeah, I that that Mills Brothers, and Tony Bennett, Frank Sinatra. That's what 
reminds Ooh. me of my, my and Louis Prima. And oh, remember yeah, that's yeah. my favorite stuff that my parents have interest, yeah. in, in, in introduced me to. To Pink Floyd, Led Zeppelin, and Queen are my favorite things that my older brothers and sisters interest, mm -hmm. in, uh -huh. got me interested in. And then yeah. bands in the '90s are like. Probably the band that's called Tool is probably my number one favorite band that I found myself. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I like. Uh, you know, in the fifties, in the late fifties, my girlfriend and I were like, our first job at Travelers Insurance would go out to Vegas, and we listened to Louis Prima so often because he was in the lounge. So it was no, no cost. You just go in there and order a drink in Vegas. I mean, you'd be and seeing listen him live? to what live? Live with his oh, great sweater. Oh, oh yeah. come on! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, but I know. Just like that, casually, just walking around. We the just walk in. Louis, Louis Prima's, Prima's there. there. Yeah. Kelly Smith's right there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, I know. It was it was pretty great. There's an album, the, the live one from um, uh, Lake Tahoe. Yeah. That album. The energy on that, I think, is the best live recording I've ever heard. Yeah, they, they their energy between each other is so good. These <laughs> people that sang in Vegas that were kind of like. They that was their world. Yeah, they were just there. Yeah, it wasn't Amazing. like a big show, and you yeah. made a, no. they were just the kind of the. My my Tuesday girlfriend night's was entertainment. A, yeah, <laughs> my girlfriend was a really pretty woman, and uh, it, it Sinatra hit a snag there, there where he was not very popular. But he got back to Vegas, and we were walking. Sinatra's coming toward us, and he said to my girlfriend, "You know, you're really pretty." You gonna come tonight? And he sang my funny Valentine, and oh, wow. uh, yeah, oh, it was quite thrilling. Wow. wow. <laughs> yeah, but the, he wasn't, you know, he was dirt in those days. That was, you know, <laughs> uh, I mean, after Ava Gardner and all that, you know, so he was mud. It took him a while to get on top again, but I wow. always felt that when he passed away, that whole era was, I mean, oh, it I was just Sinatra. such a mourning yeah, period yeah. for that whole era being gone, you know. Yeah. Mm. So anyway, <laughs> some years ago I was in San Francisco and my daughter took me to the Botanic Gardens and they have this thing called flower pianos where they set up a piano in different areas and somebody comes and, and plays that piano and people gather around and they move like from station to station. Well, there was this one area under the Redwoods that was a queen group and they were doing Bohemian Rhapsody. Oh, wow. Now that place had like... I don't know, 50 or 60 people. They were all white-haired. And when they started to sing, the people knew every single word. Wow. Every, I was like, and then on and on, and I went, I've never seen anything like that. It was like, it was almost like they were all puppets on strings, and they knew everything. And of course, nobody wanted to leave. They wanted to do it again. And, right. and I, I, I think that was my experience. I, I didn't grow up with Queen because by that time I was an old lady. But I knew the song, but right. I had never seen. Oh, he was fantastic. People mm. so almost, they were like crazy. It was really interesting. Just they knew every single word. I do that with Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young. I know every word. There are all, there are only two pieces of media entertainment that I can put on the television that I know will consistently bring my children's fervor down, <laughs> and that's if I put on Mr. Rogers, who I think is probably the best human that ever lived. Yeah, <laughs> yeah yes, opinion. you're right. There. And then and and if I put on Queen's um, either Queen's Live Aid set from '85 or I put on their live set from Montreal in like 1981 they will sit Quietly. and watch Freddie mm -hmm. Mercury mm -hmm. and my daughter will turn to me and go like he's so good yeah, yeah. Was good. Like, what a she, voice she, like, and, she, I like, just found something out yeah, dad right? she, and I'm, I'm just like I'm just like watch how this person commands I'm like he no, I'm like I tell you all the time I take it very seriously being a front man when I perform as just a singer because I think for those 40 minutes on stage, I am in charge of everyone's good time. And yeah, what is my right, job? Right? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to make sure that we all have a great time. time. And that's what Freddie Mercury really was like. <laughs> yeah. That's because of it. Do I bring a chair next week, Connor? <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, yeah. Do that. Yeah. And if you're going to come, show up probably 15 minutes early because yeah. people will be grabbing their spots. In yeah, the right. And you'll want a good <laughs> How spot. How funny. Yeah. And of course, no traffic ever gets through in that <laughs> area. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we have to leave a spot for cars, but everybody's pretty cool about yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, because there's kids running all over the place. And oh, it sounds like fun. Yeah, and and the neighbors fun. are pretty pretty cool. With Our it. neighbors are great. 
Great, great. Mm-hmm. There's one person in the neighborhood who has called the cops on us a couple oh. times. But the cop came once and he said, I know what you're doing here. It's awesome. If I wasn't working right now, I'd be right here. Yeah. Wow. Like, this is great. He's like, we got he's, like he's like, if so- someone is legally allowed to make a complaint, i got to come and serve the complaint. He's like, I'm going to go tell them you're going to be done at 745 and you're, you're well, fine. And, and he's and like, the here's, the, uh, here's the uh, non-emergency phone number. Do me a favor. Every time you're doing this from this point call forward, two hours before you play, call because it'll be the same shift supervisor and let them know, hey, this, this is what's going to happen. Do this. And I started doing that and never complained since. Uh, mm-hmm. You know what's so, so interesting is there is always one who, for whatever reason... Get off my lawn. No, yeah. it's just it's, Well, <laughs> the, the guy across the street from me. I have a man that lives across the street from me. He's lived there as long as I have, which is 25 years, okay? Mm-hmm. Maybe ten years ago, eight years ago, I have a party every Christmas. Yeah. Okay. And Craig, my boyfriend that is dead, but anyway, he invited a friend of his, a black woman, a very nice, wonderful teacher from Pasadena. And this guy, she parked in front of his house, and he oh, came okay. out and gave her shit for parking in front of his house. Like he doesn't own the fucking street. Excuse right. me. And I thought to myself, there's <sighs> always one in every crowd, you know? There's one guy Nimbyites. who can't live in a neighborhood with other people. I mean, right. Other I black people, especially. I, I don't know. I think mm. Craig thought it was that she was black. I think mm. it was anybody that would have parked in front of his house. Uh-huh. He would have had a hemorrhage. Because he's just, he's very territorial. If I were black, I'd be dead by now. <laughs> I would be. I would. Oh, God. <laughs> it really would not be an easy life. I mean, yeah. you wonder, really. Um, somebody said today in the service, uh, I go to the UU church, somebody, she said something about, when I was a young kid, it came to me how easy my life was. I mean, oh, yeah. I thought I had problems, and I thought about, what if I had what if my skin were black? Right. And how I would have suffered. And then she said, from that point forward, I never felt like, I always felt like I had everything. And then mm-hmm. I wanted to help other people. It was somebody, I don't remember the context, but that came out. And I thought, well, mm-hmm. you know, it's true. I mean, we, we have white privilege, whether we like it or not. Yeah. yeah. Well, the only great thing about being black is that you can be in their culture. And I tried to be in their culture, and it, it really didn't work out very well. Yeah. So, I mean, they have their issues with us, naturally. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, I love the black culture. Anyway. Where do you all live now? Ventura. Ventura? And wh- how long, when did you move there? I moved, uh, we had a rental house uh, on the lanes, if you know Ventura, off of Pierpont Boulevard, the little alleys that go to the ocean. Yes. Yeah. Uh, bought that in 72, and I moved in in 92, and I've been there ever since. Wow. Yeah. Wow, that's beautiful. What a great little spot. Oh, yeah, it's that a, is a right cute there. little place. It's yeah. a little <laughs> tiny it's cottage. so cute. And, yeah. yeah. It, it's a shack, but I love it. Are those the lanes, and there's uh, the one... The, I think it's like the Ventura County Beach Park or something. Yeah, like yeah, that. and you decide. So, yeah. It's and my yard. People is fly their giant kites. Connor, there. my yard is always available for. I have a real big yard. I say I have a three thousand uh, foot house. Yeah, uh, you know what I mean. Yeah, but two are outside, so uh, <laughs> it's it. always available for poetry. Uh, anybody you could, you could have a great poetry. reading. Yeah, I could have great reading in my yard. So yeah. keep be, that in mind. I would be happy to supply the PA. Oh, that, oh yes, <laughs> it would be a wonderful <laughs> evening. We'll, we'll bring it together. <laughs> <laughs> what about, uh, you're in Newberry Park. I you're have here. lived in Newberry Park since 1978. Wow. 20 years in the Dutch Havens yeah. over by Banyan School and 24 years in Vestientos. I got something to show you that's going to make you excited. Hold on. <laughs> oh, that's going to be so much fun next week. Yeah. <laughs> really. I mean, you guys want to come? When's the last time you heard a garage band? I have never heard a garage band. Oh, okay. So, uh, yeah. Do you remember seeing signs like this? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. 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 This is I, the original Bear Creek well, of course, drive. When sign this here. place was open, I saw yeah. it built. So my, my neighbor who just moved a year ago was this guy Jim Bernardi, great guy. And he was the foreman responsible for the build-out of these neighborhoods. Is it Venardi? 
B Bernardi. Okay. Bernardi. And and um, this was actually the third garage bay of the house. And um, and so I had these you know designs on like I want to build a room within a room. I want a real studio. I don't know how to do any of these things. You know. <laughs> and uh, and and so I'm struggling with my one friend. We're kind of futzing around trying to finish off this room because that was just concrete and bare stud wall and everything. And um, he talks to my wife down at the park. And uh, he's like, does your husband know what he's doing? And she's like, no. <laughs> and he's like, oh, well, maybe I'll go talk to him. You know? And he came by the next day, and we're futzing around trying to figure out. He's like, so what are you doing? And I tell him the plans and stuff like that. And he's like, do you know what you're doing? <laughs> I'm like, no. He's like, he's like, well, I'm old and bored. I could use a, something to do. You know, you want a hand? I'll show you how to do this stuff. You know? And he's like, I, I built your house. You know? <laughs> and I'm like, so I'm like yeah. And yeah, so please. regardless of whether I could even work that day or not, he showed up at 8 a.m. Every, 8 every morning and we, and we worked in here. Wow. And I remember we were um, demoing down the drywall from the ceiling above this garage bay. And above there are all the joists, the second floor joists. And I go, wow, that'd be funny if that was your handwriting. And he grabs a piece of broken like draw, drywall and writes the same thing. And he's like, perfect match. And he's like, that was the top plate here. He's Jeez. like, the park down here used to be the lumber yard for building out all these homes. Wow. And we cut all the boards and stack them and send them over here. He's like, that was the top plate from that board. It just happened yeah. to end up here where we can see it. So when and I moved here, geez. yeah. Wendy didn't he go through. He gave me this anyway. That's yeah, right. it was yeah, a part, parting gift. When he Wendy moved. didn't go through. Yeah. Lynn Road didn't go through. If Lynn you lived Road in New Rick Park, the only way you could get to Thousand Oaks was the freeway. Wow. It was. Wendy stopped at Lynn Road. There was nothing after that. So you um, had to take Kimber down. What, well, Kimber didn't. You know, Kimber yeah. basically, you know, Kimber is the same as it was, but you couldn't really get from here to Thousand Oaks except to get on the freeway. Gotcha. Because, the, well, there was that way around, uh, you know, where Smart and Final is. Yes. But yeah. nobody knew that. Yeah. And Hillcrest didn't go through. So wow. if you lived in Newbury Park and there was a fire, you were fucked. Mm -hmm. Wow. It was really, because uh, that happened in 82. <laughs> wow. And I, I was scared because we had fire. It was the Green Meadow fire. It was really bad. But it's interesting. When I, because you know, the Dutch Havens have been here, they were built in the 60s, okay? I was married to a military officer and I came to California in 1968. He was stationed at Oxnard Air Force Base, which is now Camarillo Airport. Airport yeah. And we lived in old Air Force housing in Camarillo. And one day we took that road past what is now Cal State Channel Islands. At that time it was. Right. Hotel California. California, and we drove up that hill. Except it was much worse than it is. And we come upon, come up the hill, and we go through all this. And suddenly, there's this track sitting out in the middle of nowhere. And I'm thinking, why would they build all the way out here? There's, there were no roads to get there. And then I ended up buying one of those homes with my second husband. Wow, it's very strange, really. <laughs> wow. And that house was built in '64. We moved in '78. And lived there till '98 when Dos Vientos opened, and yeah. we were the f seventh home in Dos Vientos. Wow, nice. Lived there I love years. it here. Oh, yeah. man, I have no, and like you know, since we've moved here, I've done some really cool trips in Peru and all different kinds of spots. And every time I come home from a trip, I always drive up PCH and come up over to 23 and through mm -hmm. Hidden Valley and here, you know. Mm -hmm. And coming down, and I was just like. What am I missing anywhere else? And I was like, I'm like, this looks like North. It like, looks like Tuscany, like the lower hills going into Switzerland. This looks like yeah. South Island, New Zealand. This looks like um, Peru. You know, like I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, this is this is everything. It this is a got wonderful. Place. It's a Connor, I dropped to my knees <laughs> when I amazing. first got here. I'm, d I'm not worthy. Oh, thank you, God. I know. So uh, I, I certainly am never living off the West Coast. Yeah. yeah, I have lived in the Midwest. I've lived on the East Side. I've lived in Denmark. I've lived a lot of places. I would live in Denmark three months a year, but only the warm ones. Mm -hmm. I like I, Denmark. But. I think concurrently, while we're chatting, we should each pull up one more poem, and we'll sure. we'll, we'll give our listeners one last uh, one, okay. one last poem to enjoy, and uh, and then we'll call it a day. I'd lo I, I love this. I love doing having three people it's here. Fun. And, uh, just <laughs> Drive the, your own grace. You know, uh, let let things evolve and devolve and transmutate into everything. That's the whole point of this, right? 
That's great. Who's ready? You well, I guess I am. This is another recent one. I brought some old ones, but I figure, well, I might as well do it. I'm just thinking about how lightly I once flashed along, rocking to my favorite song, backbeat of smoldering, sizzling blues. Youth once lived comfortably in my feathered nest. Now the soft down caught the breeze resides no more. I must remember to pace these old bones. Uh, fight to get up, not just sit. Emblazon these golden years. Maybe a proud tattoo, a sardonic reminder not to race when going up the hill. No matter what the age, music is a constant. Screams happiness and peace. Lose myself in rhythm until one day we finally hear all, we finally all hear breaking news. Elvis has left the building. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. That's great. Do you have one in your hand there? Yeah, I, uh, I kind of love to write in different forms. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people don't appreciate it now, but I like form. So this is considered a trio lay. Um, and I think every poet that I know of has written about a jack-around a tree. I mean, <laughs> right. <laughs> so this is my poem. It's called The Passion of Purple. Beauty blooms on jacaranda trees, a purple rain of flowers as they fall. Descend to earth, entwined by sun, by breeze. Ah, beauty blooms on jacaranda trees. As rain fades, wet shoes pick up petals, leaves. Plum imprints tramp on carpet in the hall. Oh, beauty blooms on jacaranda trees. A violet stain of flowers as they fall. <laughs> <laughs> Violet stain of flowers. <laughs> I love that. That is great. Marcy. Okay, this is one from my childhood. Uh, this is one of those where I had a picture and wrote from it. It's called Losing the Elms. Christiana Avenue, Chicago. My childhood home was there. Quiet street lined with small bungalows built in the 20s. Simple, modest dwellings. Narrow city lots, small neat gardens behind. Planted 30 years before, gracing each home house, a spreading elm tree. Stout trunks, arched canopies, outdoor cathedral. These monarchs joined branches across the road, created a bower of urban beauty, provided well-loved shade in s summer searing heat. We played as children do under their cover, Watched clouds drift through those leafy arms, saw bare limbs sway in bluster of December wind. One fall day they came with monster saws, cut down all the elms, left our poor street bereft and bare. Dutch elm disease, they said, all must go. As a child, I couldn't understand. I cried, I mourned the trees, especially my own. The naked street, forlorn and sad, in spring, they planted young trees, maples, buckeyes, catalpas. In front of my house, a sturdy maple grew. After some years, it too was tall. The leafy crown gave shade, a lovely tree, but not the same as elms. No more would branches join to make an arbor bridge across the city street. In I get very emotional with this one. In losing the elms, my childhood was lost. Mm -hmm. Ron, do you have another one? I actually only brought the one with me. I didn't realize I was. And then you brought the one that I asked for? <laughs> <laughs> I, that was not planned, by the way. There you go. Look directly at that. That is excellent. All right, so either I have to read one about the loss of childhood or I have to read one about the fires in this area. What should I do? Mm. The fires. The fires. Because okay. we all have written poems about that. Right. Mm. All right. This one's called Fire Optics. 
A cold wind blows round my leaves, stifling inhales know they coat my lungs. Will I ever remove its stain? Will I ever be as I perceive? For years now a slow fall, masked in praise I draw within, others view never congruent to my own. At the trunk, a shimmer that tells an underground story. Count the rings and learn its amplitude. It invites one to pry, to help unearth, or to near it, or to nourish and leave be. For what we hope for and what passes is such a comedy. For the roots hold my mold. To forget their first move down dishonors the manifestation above. Long after the changes of fire and weather, a thickened circle is nature's straightforward account of cataclysm. And I came back to the same spot just days later. Bright cries from my daughter, now tempered and tested, show her ability to see silver. Perhaps the light in my roots is fitting, reminds me of my place in the stars. Mm. Wow. Pretty. That one, that one was published in that, uh, Smoke and ember, or fire and yeah, smoke. Yeah, uh, I did one of those. Yeah, two, right? yeah, that was um, that was really cool. And getting to read down in Ventura, and you know, I for for my attempts to try to give venue to poetry, I don't get out that much as a poet. I kind of stick in this little area here, <laughs> and uh, th that can be a double-edged sword. You know, you get gain intimacy with the proc proximity, you know, to the people around you. And uh, I think this this is my way to try to um, meet others, you know, and bring others and in, in, and in, uh, you. Know, I've got a question. Yeah. I'm kind of curious. Yeah. When 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 do you write poetry, and when do you write lyrics? Wow, um, poetry I can write whenever. Lyrics I tend to have to have the music crafted first. So you write the po the lyrics. You write to the, to music. the music. Yeah, the lyric in really? and, and some of my That's best true. songs I've written lyric wise in terms of what what has landed best with listeners are the stuff I write at the very last second. It could be stuff literally I am at the microphone in the <laughs> in session and I'm writing lyrics furiously. Wow. And and uh, you know I did one uh, a song called Bed and Breakfast. I grew up at a bed and breakfast in, in Pennsylvania, and I wrote a song about that. I was literally writing the writing the lyrics at the last time. Wow! Yeah, at the at the last second, you know, that that, that was pretty cool. I have a question for all of you. Yeah, I have heard people say I have nothing to write about. Oh, oh my goodness. goodness! And I, I can't imagine that. I mean, I I feel sad for that statement. I have so many things that I want to write and that I haven't written. I don't know if I'll ever write them all, but is is that ever a problem? that you feel like, what am I going to write about? Oh, I have writer's block. <laughs> I have writer's block, but it's not for lack of content. It's just for, the like, it's an energetic deficiency in the moment. You, you got know? other shit you got to do. Or, yeah, or, or i got to, you know, do the dishes. <laughs> well, the, one of the reasons I continue to take that class even though I don't like the man that teaches it. <laughs> I don't like him. <laughs> tell us, tell us. What's, what's his name? I can tell you his no, name. No, <laughs> don't but tell anyway, us. I don't like him as a teacher. He's, he's a, what they call in Danish, a blair, which means a... a blow horn. It's a, a blow it up your ass. Yeah. That's what it is, actually. Anyway, um, I do it because of the prompts. Because I'm forced... Yeah. To write something in ten minutes. That that's the best poems I've ever written come out of those you gotta write a poem about <laughs> in ten minutes. Now it, it never comes out it, as it ends, you know. But it does get me going. Hmm. And that's one of the reasons I'm kinda sad that they're hmm. opening up, but they're opening up in Santa Monica because I don't want to go to I'll Santa. tell you a secret. My is <laughs> what don't I want people to know? Right about that. <laughs> That's a, I would say, and poetry is my outlet for the things I feel worst about myself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't want people to know this. I could never write it, but then I think about it, and, and you do, and you fight yeah. about it. Yeah, I've just written one on loneliness. Mm. Uh, very threatening. Oh. Well, I tell people that I'm most honest in, in yeah. my poetry. It, but I, I think right. to admit. We get lonely, you know, b bone chilling lonely yeah. is is hard for me. 
I, I wrote a poem about from a, a painting by Pablo Picasso. He painted this self-portrait when he was about 20 years old, and he was obviously very depressed and feeling very lonely if you read the biography. I wrote a poem about that, and Wednesday night, here's my promo, Wednesday night <laughs> at Thousand Oaks Library, yeah. I'm going to give a little talk on how I wrote this poem. Oh, I'm coming. Cool. And, and, and I know, I'm going to be there in person. And I'd yeah. like to invite you all, yeah. all of you, to yeah. also maybe next year we can get you in. Just talk about one poem instead of reading ten Why poems. Why it came yeah. out. Yeah. How it came to be to inspire yeah, each other. I think that's a good And it would yeah. make us feel less alone. Yeah. I don't know I, why I find that so threatening mm -hmm. to let people know that I get lonely. Mm -hmm. Is is there more power in is it is there more power in being comf comfortable in the feeling of aloneness or is life simply not as good if not shared with someone else? Yeah. Well, aloneness is great. No, there's a difference. No, there's Alone a difference. and lonely. A, a yes, lonely. Sir. Yes. And I uh, try to dissect it, like, wh what, because I love to be alone, I need a lot of alone time, oh my God, to recover, mm -hmm. because of my life, but, no, I'm talking about lonely. Yes. Very different than alone time. <laughs> well, you can feel very lonely, uh, surrounded by people. Oh, absolutely. You get that, the worst was when I was married, I mean, I never was so lonely. <laughs> yeah. 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 That, the, the, that feeling, that, that Sonder feeling kind of freaks me out sometimes when you realize like... What feeling? Sonder. It's that feeling that like the people around you have a life as rich and vivid as you are and you'll never know much you're, you're, about it, you know? Yeah. Do you ever feel like... I have had this feeling where I'm walking through the world, no one can see me, I'm, a, I'm invisible, and I'm watching all these people do their thing, whatever it is, and they don't see me. I'm just yeah. You're invisible. I'm invisible. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm kind of. You're not meandering. part of things, right? Does, yeah. Does I sometimes that excite you, and sometimes that freak you out, or is it always a sp specific feeling? Mm. Well, um, okay. I had bariatric surgery. I used to be very heavy. Okay, and I lost 80 pounds. And one of the great things about losing that weight was I could be invisible. I didn't. I felt when I was heavy that if I walked into a room, everybody looked at me and said, "Oh, look at that fat." Hmm. Right. I don't know if they did or not, but that's the way I felt. Right. So I think it's both. It's a, a sometimes it's loneliness, the feeling that you're alone in a place, and all these people are doing important things, and you're yeah. kind of you're not included. You're not something. part of it. And then yeah. there's the other one that says, "I can be here and watch them, and they don't know I'm watching them. They they don't know that I'm looking at them and." Mm -hmm. Thinking about them and maybe taking their their DNA for a poem hmm. or whatever. It's 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 a dichotomy. It's not a it's not a simple answer. Right. No, I I I, I wouldn't expect it to be. And I think it's all it's all a very personal matter of taste. I I certainly have not felt lonely in the last two hours that we've been. <laughs> no, 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 we've got chatting. this incredible. But this is uh, depth of, of this fun. people talking. This is about really him. great. I I really appreciate all of you coming and doing this. And uh, you know, it's not you know this isn't meant to be the last of it. So I love doing this. Um, I think this works really well for having the poets that are the readers to have <laughs> yeah. have this as an option to come yeah. in and mm -hmm. do and chat and yeah. and all of that. So I really do appreciate it. So. Well, yeah. thanks for inviting us. Yeah, it was fun. Of Connor, where, where can we go to, to yeah. hear this podcast? This later? this is all, uh, it's called The Thousand. Have you recorded everything? Oh, yeah. This oh. Is, I've got two oh, microphones the whole time. <laughs> oh, my God. All those oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have been I'm quite letting quite people know I get lonely. <laughs> 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 oh, I love it. Um, well, this is called The Thousand Tales Podcast. And so I started this also in co during COVID. Yeah. When I started the jam, started meeting all these people around here. I said, let me sit down and do long form. I said, I want, I'm going to take the opportunity to just learn my neighbors. So this guy, Thaddeus Francis, two, lives two houses down. He, taught, he came over and we chatted for like two and a half hours. George... Uh, um, a Greek last name. He came over and talked about coming with his dad to Detroit to get a Chevy in the 60s, driving it to New York, having it shipped to Italy, and driving to Kuwait through the Middle East in this uh, old Chevy. Crazy. Like, you know, just like these long, long, long interviews. And, uh, and and then I started using it as an outlet to post the audio from the, jam from the jams. And mm -hmm. then 
and then started doing it for the poetry readings, and now we're doing it for for actual poetry discussions. This was like really that, so. very. Yeah. I mean, I've known these two women for a long time, and we really like each other. But it, it's 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 more than that. It's a I deeper mean, experience. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's really. I think there's a difference when you when you share something. I, I don't I don't think there's anything more intimate in a written word than um, than poetry. To me, I think it's, it's good thing. I, I, that's what I'll tell Robert when he says to me, "Why poetry?" By the way, yeah. this guy, as I said, wrote all his life, and now because we're together, he sends me all this stuff about poetry, mm -hmm. and he wrote a poem. Well, there he you go. He wrote a poem and sent it to me, and it was not bad. You I was pretty impressed. <laughs> you helped inspire. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes we need the muse, and sometimes we are the muse. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for being on. Okay, see you next today. Saturday. I'll be yeah. here yeah. third Good luck on Sunday, your... right. six to eight. <laughs> <laughs> Unitarian All these Universalist venues that are Fellowship. Going on. Okay. <laughs>